Heavy rainfall brings red rainstorm signal for almost seven hours. Neighboring Guangdong province is also hit by heavy downpours. And the new CEO of Cyberport talks about challenges and opportunities. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Today, the city was pounded by heavy downpours with a red rainstorm warning signal in force for nearly seven hours. Among the hardest hit districts was Saikong. Authorities received at least 12 reports of inundation, and as heavy rain persists, the amber rainstorm warning signal is still in, in effect. The observatory said the weather will remain unsettled as two bands of strong thunderstorms inch close to Hong Kong. Following the collapse of a retaining wall on Yingyi Road in Chengkwano near Hanghao Village came the small waterfall. Water washed away barricades at the construction sites, roads strewn with gravel and debris. In Ho Chung and Sai Kong, roads turned into a river. In the Sai Kong area, more than 140 millimeters of rainfall was recorded within an hour between 8 and 9 a.m. Flood water took over Wampo Road near Chongya Street. Some vehicles broke down. Firefighters reached the site to help the driver and passengers escape from the car. A parking lot in nearby Lohas Park flooded while the red rainstorm signal was in force, affecting nearly 100 vehicles. Mud and flood water poured into the cars. After the water receded, car owners reached a car park to check the extent of damage. <laughs> One of the car owners affected was Mr. Lo, who said there is nothing you can do when disaster strike, but the damage this time was not as bad as he thought. <laughs> but Mr. Sun said it was worse than the flash flood last time during Typhoon Mankut. Also swamped was Chu Shen Road in Hanghao. Heavy downpours also led to landslides. On Clearwater Bay Road near Mankung Oak Village, a footpath caved in with fences being washed away. Water, water everywhere around Wanchuk Wan Village in Sai Kung. Residents tried to put up barricades. As some tried to have some fun. With the heavy rain and thunderstorms, the observatory issued the amber rainstorm warning signal at 7 a.m. before issuing the first red rainstorm warning signal of the year before 9 a.m. The red rainstorm warning was in force for nearly seven hours. The observatory said most precipitation fell around the eastern part of the territory, with some districts in Chengkwano logging over 400 millimeters of rainfall. Police also received requests for help from at least 15 hikers who were stranded at locations such as the Magli Host Trail. On the mainland, authorities in Zhuhai have issued red alerts for rainstorms. This came after heavy rain hit multiple regions of Guangdong province. Mimos and I reports. Following heavy downpours, some vehicles were drowned in the water. The scene was in Dongmen district in Zhuhai, where two-hour rainfall almost reached 200 millimeters in the morning. Mainland authorities issued red alerts for rainstorms, which is the highest level in Zhuhai, Xiangzhou, and the Zhuhai National High-Tech Industrial Development Zone. Despite the efforts, weather and the advice of authorities to stay indoors, some residents decided to go out. However, it was not an easy thing to do with the disrupted public transport. More than 100 bus routes were suspended. In Zhongshan, a similar situation can be seen. A crocodile breeding center lost four reptiles because the rain damaged its fences. While one has been found, three crocodiles are still missing. News 9, TVB News. Five people have been convicted of arson and perverting the course of justice in connection with a petrol bomb case at the Happy Valley police station four years ago. 
The case happened in March 2020. Among the six people arrested, four were charged with two counts of arson, including Ai Wing Chung. One defendant who helped them escape later pleaded guilty. The district court judge said the case was premeditated and everyone had a common criminal intention. The other two defendants in the same case were Ngai's mother and his brother. And they were also charged with one count of arson and obstructing justice for having attempted to destroy evidence. Police seized a cache of 24 glass bottles, 32 gas canisters, and chemicals that could be used to make petrol bombs. The case has been adjourned until the 24th of next month for mitigation pleas. Secretary for Housing Winnie Ho said the building of transitional housing is entering a harvest period. She said the target was to build 20,000 transitional housing units and the land has been secured for 21,000 such units. And 13,600 units have already been built. She said the construction target will be achieved early next year. Ho was speaking at an event today where the operators of six transitional housing projects signed a memorandum of understanding with the Scout Association of Hong Kong. Under the arrangement, scouting activities will be held for the young people living in the transitional housing projects, giving them scout training as well as coaching on leadership and teamwork. The government has set its sights on transforming Hong Kong into an international innovation and technology hub with a thriving ecosystem for tech companies and startups. Among the key drivers is Cyberport. Speaking with TVB News, its new CEO Rocky Chang shared with us his vision for Hong Kong's smart city and digital economy initiatives. Rocky Jen took on the role as the chief executive officer of Cyberport in April, following a 30-year career in IT and finance-related sectors, including leadership positions in Bank of China. One of his top priorities is trawling talent. The most challenging for every uh, region or country uh, is the talent. So uh, talent is our, our, our key targets to attract and cultivate the, the talents in, in our uh, cyber port uh, and then uh, to support the, the overall community. They include training in-house talent in cybersecurity. This after a report from the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Personal Data found cyberports in frequent security audits and the necessary retention of personal data. That allowed the servers to be attacked by ransomware last year, which led to a data leak involving more than 13,000 individuals. Chang said they will collaborate with third-party companies to assess and improve their cybersecurity level. As of mid-April, Cyberport also formed partnership with the China Academy of Information and Communications Technology to establish an international supernode under Xinhua BIF in Hong Kong. Xinhua BIF is a national-level blockchain infrastructure, and Cyberport will help guide its applications in industries including finance, trade and healthcare. Cyberport also signed a memorandum of understanding to promote the Beijing and Hong Kong Web 3.0 ecosystem partnership program, which aims to attract high-caliber mainland inner tech companies to Cyberport. Rocky Jiang also said he hopes to export the tech outcome including fintech and Web3 products developed at Cyberport to other countries including the Middle East and Southeast Asia. All these are expected to help the city's development in innovation and technology. We were nurturing uh, and supporting technology startups in Hong Kong. Uh, and second, promoting and development of science and technology in Hong Kong and facilitating the development of digital economy and smart city of Hong Kong. Floods and landslides are devastating several areas of the world. At least 14 people have been killed in Indonesia. Kenya is bracing itself for Cyclone Hidayah with hundreds of people already killed from weeks of heavy rains. Southern Brazil has seen its worst flooding in 80 years, with at least 37 dead. David Garrett reports. Indonesian rescue workers wade through waist-high water as they desperately search for those trapped. The rain has been described as high intensity and hit hard, causing a landslide. Shots from the air show water depths of three metres. Dozens of houses completely swept away in South Sulawesi, an island east of Borneo. Residents had to be rescued on dinghies. More than a thousand families moved to safety. Indonesia is prone to landslides during the rainy season. In some places, deforestation has made the problem worse. In March, around 30 were killed in floods on Sumatra. 
Parts of East Africa have been battling flooding for weeks. People in Bujumbura in Burundi have resorted to canoes to get around. The United Nations says for residents in rural areas, it is increasingly difficult to get to the market to buy food. The country launched an appeal alongside the UN as far back as last month. Tanzania and Kenya have been heavily impacted too. In the last month or so, more than 200 have died from floods in Kenya. Boulders have been swept along streets, acting like wrecking balls. Schools are closed and it is unclear when they will reopen. Rain could be heard drumming on the roof as the president spoke. Consistent torrential rain has unleashed devastating floods which have claimed 210 lives as of today. It has also caused injuries to many more and wreaked havoc on property, infrastructure and livelihoods. No corner of our country has been spared. Media ministers and the public listened as Ruto warned the country could face its first ever cyclone. Our country will remain in this cyclical crisis for a long time unless and until we confront the existential threat of climate change. Our climate action agenda is informed by the sad reality that our country's future remains under threat. This is central Russia, which is used to seeing its fair share of rain. Even with substantial dams and flood protections in place, some villages in the Tumen region have been cut off. Water levels in the Ishim River have risen above 11 and a half metres, half a metre higher than the previous record of 2017. It's not stopped raining since Monday in Brazil's southernmost state. It's been called Rio Grande do Sul's worst disaster in recent history. Dozens are dead and the search for those missing is being hampered. It is the fourth time the country has seen a state of emergency caused by floods in less than 12 months. This ship got stuck because high water levels caused it to hit a bridge. The storm is moving north, but rain is still expected to fall here. It could mean this week this area will suffer a metre of rain. David Garrett, TVB News. And still ahead. Protests against the war in Gaza continue in the US and beyond. Michelle Yeoh is given the Medal of Honor at the White House and the Star Wars legend was also there. Welcome back. Demonstrations against the Gaza war ended at some U.S. universities after school leaders struck deals with pro-Palestinian protesters. Nawasu Karim with more. A pro-Palestinian protester at the University of Mississippi confronting hecklers. A man appearing to make possibly racist monkey noises and gestures at the black woman. Police separate them. Republican Congressman Mike Collins appearing to endorse the hecklers online, writing, Ole Miss taking care of business. The pro-Palestinian protests and counter-protests continue in the U.S. and spread around the world and are becoming more dangerous. At the heart of the protests in Columbia University, the New York Police Department said one of its officers accidentally fired his gun inside a building while clearing out protesters. It's called an accident for a reason. Right? It's called an accidental discharge. The, uh, the sergeant at the time was trying to clear an area, an unknown location that was dark. Uh, so he moved, he made the decision to transition his firearm from his dominant hand to his non-dominant hand so he could better try to gain access to the office. Uh, with that, he unintentionally uh, pulled the trigger of his weapon and discharged the firearm. Some schools, including Brown, Northwestern and Rutgers, struck deals with pro-Palestinian protesters, avoiding disruptions of final exams and graduation ceremonies. Protesters have set up tented encampments in more than 45 campuses in the U.S. since April 17th. They want their schools to end any financial links with Israeli entities. At McGill University in Montreal, Canada, police lined up to separate opposing camps of demonstrators waving Israeli and Palestinian flags. At the University of Toronto, students set up camps in solidarity with their U.S. peers. In Australia, opposing protests emerged at Sydney University involving pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel supporters. An encampment was also set up at Mexico's National Autonomous University in Mexico City in support of Palestinians. Thousands also protested in Paris, France. While pro-Palestinian students have dominated the protests over the past two weeks, pro-Israelis are trying to have their voices heard. 
At Indiana University in Bloomington, Jewish students held a demonstration to protest against Hamas and anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism tends to spike anytime Israel comes up in the news. Um, and I have seen some really disturbing and awful and hateful things being said across the nation um, at very nice universities and institutions. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. The newly installed commander of the United States Indo-Pacific Command said the U.S. will strengthen ties with regional allies and stand ready to handle the so-called expansionist actions of China in the region. Our world faces a complex problem set in the troubling actions of the People's Republic of China and its rapid buildup of forces. We must be ready to answer the PRC's increasingly intrusive and expansionist claims in the Indo-Pacific region. Beijing had earlier criticized certain people in the U.S. for trying to play up the threat of China, while stressing that the Indo-Pacific region should be a place of peaceful development instead of an arena for geopolitical wrangling. The U.S. Air Force has made history by sending an experimental F-16 fighter jet on a flight on a flight control by artificial intelligence, or AI, and not a human pilot. NBC News has more. This is a rare look at the future of the U.S. Air Force in combat. It's called VISTA, an unmanned fighter jet piloted by artificial intelligence. Flying head-to-head -head in a dogfight with a manned F-16, even outperforming the human pilot. Defense officials say the U.S. is the only military in the world with this technology, successfully flying a jet with artificial intelligence. And this is the first time cameras have been allowed to see it. Up till now, there has not been a pathway for machine learning agents to control uh, the you know, flight critical systems of an aircraft. On Thursday, the Air Force Secretary made an unannounced trip to Edwards Air Force Base. Suiting up and going for a ride in a mock dogfight, flying nearly the speed of sound, separated by just 1,000 feet from the manned fighter jet. He says the technology still needs work. We still got a ways to go with it, but making good progress. But some test pilots aren't sure. This artificial intelligence is robot, and they're, they're so new, and we don't really understand fully how they work. So you don't trust the aircraft to be flown by AI at this point? Uh, no, not really. Like drones, they could fly ahead of manned aircraft during combat, conducting strikes too dangerous for human pilots. But unlike drones, the computer will be in charge, not an operator thousands of miles away. And even though humans will still be involved in making key decisions, this raises serious questions. Is that a possibility, really, this kind of technology going rogue? I think it's too early to say it is or it isn't. Do you ever see a, a point of fully autonomous weapons, so U.S. Air Force aircraft that are fully autonomous weapons. We're not going to unleash killer robots on the battlefield to kill anything they want. That's not going to happen. We're going to make sure that we comply with the laws of war. Kendall says the future is not far away. AI could be in cockpits in the next few years. Computers flying missions once considered too complicated for anything but the human mind, soon changing the face of combat aviation. In the U.S., Oscar-winning actress Michelle Yeoh was among those to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom at the White House. David Garrett reports. A medal for Michelle, the Presidential Medal of Freedom for shattering stereotypes. Equal parts performer and pioneer, Michelle Yeoh continues to enrich American culture and inspires us to believe in possibilities on the big screen and beyond. The 61-year-old who made movies in Hong Kong was one of the recipients. Yo, who won an Oscar for Best Actress and starred in the film Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Recipients also included former mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, and former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. 19 incredible people whose relentless curiosity, inventiveness, ingenuity, and hope have kept faith in a better tomorrow. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was also honored. She caused friction between China and the U.S. when she traveled to Taiwan in 2022. All the winners were given a standing ovation at the conclusion. For this year's presidential freedom recipient. Michelle Yeoh was not the only Hollywood star at the White House. With May the 4th falling on this weekend, a man famous for May the Force Be With You also met Biden.
here I have a special guest, as you can see. Uh, Mark Hamill has decided to join us on this wonderful Friday. Here we go. Just for, okay, <laughs> how many of you had Mark Hamill will leave the press briefing on your bingo card? Hands? Yeah, me either. And look, I just got to meet the president, and he gave me these aviator glasses. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love the merch. Mark Hamill, a Democrat, says Biden is a force for good. The Star Wars legend was granted an audience in the Oval Office. I, no I called him Mr. President. He said, you can call me Joe. And I said, can I call you Joe B. One Kenobi? <laughs> and, uh, he liked that. Having been famous for so long, the man who played Luke Skywalker in films spanning decades had first come to the White House a long time ago. You could say this was the return of the Jedi. David Garrett, TVB News. Back locally, as the city strives to recover its strength in the international exhibition business, a two-day whiskey festival was launched at Chim Sha Choi today. Mo Zeng Ai was there. The sixth whiskey festival began this afternoon, with about 60 exhibitors joining the event this year, featuring merchants from more commonly known whiskey produced country such as Japan to a relative newcomer in the industry, Israel. The event organizers at Hong Kong has a vibrant market for the spirit. Hong Kong is a very good hub for whiskey. It's a well-educated market. It's an educational market where some markets don't provide education at all. I think Hong Kong is really well developed. And it's, and it's well recognised within the international community as a destination for, for trying whiskies. He expected a two-day event to attract 3,000 visitors, with a good number of them being mainlanders. Potentially by tomorrow we'll go, we'll go over that because um, we have a lot of residents that, that are here in Hong Kong. They're looking for something to do over the weekend. Maybe it pops up and they see it and they oh, let's go and do something like that. This exhibitor representing an Israeli distiller said the company needs to work more on promoting their spirits to counter the challenge of brand loyalty in the Hong Kong whiskey market. I think there's still lots of potential here and I think um, also there's so many new players in the world, They're not just the conventional guys. So I think it, it's going to be very interesting. The demand for Taiwanese whiskies in the city, meanwhile, is growing. This exhibitor said the taste of Hong Kong and Taiwanese people are similar. They really like our uh, whiskey as a sweet and easy drinking. Most of the people is like uh, Hong Kong people and also some people from mainland and still have some Western people. For those who wish to gain more knowledge on whiskies, the public can also attend more than 35 whiskey classes at the festival. Mimos Nai, TVB News. And that's the news. Thank you for watching and stay dry.